Good morning. <clears throat> Last week I um, made mention of little Gus Murphy bringing me his notepad <clears throat> and showing me the notes that he had taken. And in an effort to, uh, to encourage not only Gus, uh, but all the little, the little ones to uh, do the same, to try to follow along with whoever is preaching uh, and to follow the PowerPoint. And if the points are such that they can make note of those on their notepads, uh, we want to encourage them to do that. Um, if they're too young to actually write out the words, if they can draw pictures, something of that nature, uh, to, to show that they're, they're following along, uh, they may use their own notepads. There, there are uh, sheets of paper on the table back here uh, between the office doors that some, you can pick up and utilize those if you choose to do so. But uh, either way, if, uh, if the little ones will do that, and if they, after services on Sundays, if they will bring it to me and show it to me, then I'll put a, a sticker uh, on their notepad for them. So uh, just to let them know and to remind them, we sure appreciate what they're doing. And uh, again, uh, bring it to me and let me see it, and uh, I'll acknowledge it, okay? Not just me, Daniel will do the same when it's his turn, uh, Wayne the same when he preaches and so forth. So uh, <clears throat> just to help them and to encourage them. My text for this morning is actually out of First Chronicles uh, chapter 9 and verse 13. <clears throat> I elected, however, not to have that text read simply because it, it includes a, a number of names that are extremely difficult to pronounce, and I wouldn't do that to anybody, not even my son-in-law, to try to read those names uh, up here, although I, I might do worse. <clears throat> to try to read those names uh, up here, uh, so <clears throat> I simply selected an alternative text that is related to what we're doing, uh, or will be doing this morning. But um, uh, the actual text, again, First Chronicles 9 and verse 13, and in the context of it, it deals with uh, the, uh, the return of the, uh, the exiles from captivity. And uh, specifically in this section, the priests... And they're named here, and uh, their um, their relatives and the heads of the uh, fathers' houses. And the text itself tells us that of the priests, there were one thousand seven hundred and sixty who had returned, able men in the service of the house of God. Now, the word able there, it might appear in your translation as mighty men, but I'm going to focus on the word able this morning and the idea of able men in the service of God and in the church of God. So we'll take our focus from the, uh, the Old Testament temple and we'll bring it forward to the New Testament church, if you will. I've often wondered why it is that in the church overall and in, in, in any particular congregation, there are almost always more women than there are men. I mean, you can scan any audience. In a typical congregation, and Mabelville is a typical congregation, I guess. But in a typical congregation, there will be 
Oh, about 61% women in attendance and 39% men in attendance. On a Wednesday night, midweek service, there will be, oh, about 70 to 80% women in attendance. When it comes to the volunteer services of the church, in whatever realm we need volunteers, people to serve, for the most part, women will step up to the plate. <clears throat> of those women who are married, 25% of those will come to worship services without their husbands. <clears throat> So when you look at any congregation, there's a large representative of women as opposed to men. Having observed that over the years, I've often thought, you know, there's going to be more women in heaven than there will be men. And I've kind of, <clears throat> kind of laugh about that a little bit, but I don't know. Probably not far from the truth. But that's the demographic as we look at it today. Now, while in most congregations <clears throat> there's a shortage of what I will say manpower, what I'll call manpower, there's a lot of women that are doing the work. And where there's a shortage of men, it would seem anyway, Looking back to Jesus, just looking at Jesus, he did not have any trouble drawing men into his service. I mean, look at the 12 disciples that followed him everywhere he went. <clears throat> and those 12 disciples becoming apostles later on. And these were the nucleus of his workers before the church was ever established. And then when the church is established, what you find immediately is there's male spiritual leadership in the Lord's body. And by that I simply mean when congregations are organized and established, they need elders, they need deacons. Those elders are men, and those deacons are men. When it comes to the teaching of mixed audiences in a congregation such as we have this morning, men do it. That's by God's plan. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 12, for example, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And I've always noted over the years that that particularly says, I do not allow a woman to deliver a didactic discourse in the church in a mixed audience such as what we have here. That's by God's arrangement. Then there's the need for elders, and in 1 Timothy 3, if a man desires the office, the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And here come the qualifications for an overseer, an elder in the Lord's body in any local congregation, and it's directed at the men. Likewise, deacons in verse 8. And here come the qualifications for deacons. And they follow down through about, oh, verse 10. And this is directed at the men. The women are not left out. Verse 11, on down. 
you have attention given to them. Deacons' wives, elders' wives, we always wonder. We don't know for sure, but possibly, yes. So Jesus didn't have any trouble attracting men. And when he established his church, he put men into positions of leadership. And that's the way it is now. And that's the way that it should be. The church is led by men. But the church is run by an army of women. Women who serve, women who volunteer, women who do a lot of the legwork, the hands-on work that must be done. And in all of this, going, looking back to Jesus once again, and forget all of the feminine-like pictures that you've ever seen of Jesus. He wasn't like that. He was a man's man, no doubt. And he attracted men to his service. And he was able to get 12 hard, rugged, rough fishermen or men of different vocations, some of them fishermen, to get them to drop their nets and to drop their nets for a lifetime. And we have trouble, in some cases, getting men to drop their remotes for two hours a week. Looking back to the text that I've selected, First Chronicles 9.13. 1,760 able men in the service of the house of God. And here we are in the New Testament church. We need men. And we need able men. Men who will work. Men who will serve. Men who will help. Men who will teach. Men who will visit. We need men who will do the Lord's work, who will step up to the plate. We need men who will be there because we're engaged in a battle. And that battle is against sin, it's against Satan, it's against everything that this world represents. And we're fighting a fight. And it's the good fight of faith. And we need men to fight it. In their homes, And in the congregations they represent. We need able men. We need able women too. But the text shows that we need able men in the service of God. And I've always noticed, and you have too, you know, there aren't all that many men there. Why not? Well, there may be a lot of reasons for that. And indeed there are. I'm not here this morning to explore all of that, as interesting as it is. But still, we need able men in the service of God, do we not? Amen. Now, what is an able man? What does it mean to be an able man in the service of God? Well, look at it first of all. An able man. Just think about it. An able man is someone who is available. I think of Isaiah 6 and verse 8. When God was looking for a servant, Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. All right. That's availability. Few of us will say, Here I am. Send me. But when people are available, then they're willing to serve. And people will make themselves available because their heart is there and they want to. Sometimes men have a sign hanging around their neck that says, Don't, do not disturb. Just do not disturb. 
And they don't want to come. They don't want to be here. They might come reluctantly to please their mothers, their wives, or their girlfriends. But they're not all that willing, and that's the reason for the uh, the uh, heel marks out in front of the door here sometimes that you'll notice. I'm just kidding. But an able man is someone who is available, makes himself available, doesn't have a do not disturb sign hung around his neck. An able man wants to serve. Now, <clears throat> are men preparing themselves to serve in the Lord's church? Do we have men who are thinking ahead, young men who are thinking ahead, preparing themselves for the time when they will become, hopefully, deacons, elders, preachers, whatever, teachers? Are, do we have men preparing themselves, equipping themselves in that direction and in that capacity? I think of Ephesians 4 and verse 12 in this connection. And in the establishment of the church, God set certain things in place. In Ephesians 4 and verse 11, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Equipping of the saints. Do we have men today who are equipping themselves for service? Preparing themselves. If they're not ready yet, maybe one day they will be ready to serve in the capacity of a deacon. If you will come every Sunday, are you thinking in terms of, you know, I need to grow beyond what I am now. I need to serve to grow to the point where I can serve as a deacon or to serve as an elder, an overseer in a congregation. It was announced, oh, recently of um, a Zoom workshop that Aubrey Johnson is doing to prepare men to serve as elders. If you ever think that there's the remotest possibility that you might ever want to serve in that capacity, you've got to prepare yourself at some point to get there. Are we doing that? Well, one who is available will do that. Make himself available to learn and to grow and over the years to move into a position to where he can serve as an able man in the body of Christ. All right. Now, the trends are that men are not all that available, that that fewer men will attend, that fewer will give, that fewer will serve, fewer will volunteer, and so forth and so on. The trends are not all that encouraging, but men need the Lord, men need the Lord's church, and the church needs men, able men, to serve. Does that point make sense? I hope it does. Able men not only are available, but secondly, I would say that able men are dependable. Able men, dependable. Now, for that, I'm in the book of Ephesians, and I stay in Ephesians, and I look at chapter 5 here, and I'm looking at what Paul wrote to husbands. And when I reason through what he says here, he's talking about being a dependable man at home. And here in verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. That requires a dependability, does it not? In verse 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That requires some dependability, does it not? 
In chapter 6 and verse 4, you fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the training, the nurture, admonition of the Lord. So there's, there's a requirement here of dependability. Now, we could take this over into, uh, into Titus. And I'm going to use Titus tonight. And so I'll, um, eh, I'll just reference it here. I won't read much of it really. Because Paul in Titus 2 addresses the older men. And then the younger men. And if you read what he says here, this is what it means to be an able man in the body of Christ. Somebody who's dependable and certainly dependability uh, is couched in all that Paul writes there in Titus chapter 2. And then here's another thought in 2 Timothy 2. This is not on the PowerPoint, but this just hit me this morning, actually. In, in 2 Timothy 2, and um, in verse 2, And the things that you've heard of me, that is, what you've heard from Paul, among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And then he follows that admonition by a series of examples that are male-oriented, by the way. Be a good soldier in verse 3. You compete in athletics in verse 5. Well, women do that too, of course. You're a hardworking farmer in verse 6. So here come the illustrations in a male-oriented society to say, men, step up to the plate. We need you to be dependable in the service of God. Now, what I've mentioned for you Earlier, in terms of the trends of today, not all that encouraging when it comes to dependability. But again, we need men who are, are available and will be dependable to grow a congregation. Congregations don't grow automatically. We have to work at it. It requires dependability. So an able man is a dependable man. You can set your watch by him. But then thirdly, an able man is stable. For this, I want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13. In the closing admonitions of Paul to the church at Corinth, troubled, divided, antagonistic in so many ways. And Paul comes to the end of it. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. And he says this, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version this morning, but I'm remembering my mother's Bible. And my mother's Bible says, quit you like men. And I recall the American Standard Version retained that translation in 1901. Quit you like men. We don't talk like that. Quit you like men. What does that mean? That's archaic terminology. And so I pick up my New King James Version and it's not there. But I pick up my ESV and it says, act like men. So the ESV goes back and picks it up, retains it. Act like men. All right. So he's speaking to a congregation and he's saying to all of you, you better act like men. What's that mean? Well, look at the context. That means watch. It means be steadfast in the faith. Be strong. And then he follows that with certain male examples. In the household of Stephanus, there's Achaia. And then in verse 17, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaicus. 
And then down in verse uh, 19, here's the husband and wife team of Aquila and Priscilla. Here are able men in the service of God. But he tells an entire congregation, you better act like men. Well, what does that mean? Well, the opposite of that is to act like children. And if a church is fussing and fighting and splitting or whatever, they're acting like children. Not able to get along with one another. And if you uh, think I'm stretching the point, maybe just a little bit, go back to 1 Corinthians 3. Look at what Paul said to them in 1 Corinthians 3. He said, brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, even as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you're still carnal. For whereas there's envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men, that is, on a human perspective and on a human scale. You're acting like carnal people. And basically, you're acting like children. And he said, that's how I'm going to relate to you. Now, <clears throat> the objective of every congregation should be to act like men in the sense of being adult, grown up, mature, strong, faithful, so that you can hold fast to the doctrine of Christ and you know showman religion when you see it and you oppose it. And the opposite of all of that is a church that can't get along with itself. And... Um, we need able men in the service of God, do we not? Now, a wide, uh, I don't know if it's a problem or not, but you look over the church as a whole and congregations particularly, and there's a lot of men not there. Where are they? I, I don't know. But men are called to serve God. Men, they're called, and when I say called, I mean called through the word of God, through the gospel. Men are called through the gospel to serve and be able in that service. And to teach and to exhort and edify and build up the body of Christ can only do that if you're available, if you're dependable, and if you're stable. And if, uh, um, if a man is all three of those things, then he will contribute to making a congregation the same. And the more of that you have, the better off you are. All right. So men are called by the gospel to serve in that capacity. And women are called by the gospel... To encourage their men to be that way. And to pray for them and to strengthen them in the service of God. Now, I understand that, you know, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're, we're all on the same level. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. But we're all one in Christ Jesus if we're in Christ Jesus. I understand that Galatians 3.28. I understand that point. And I don't dismiss it in the least bit. But I, I, I do want to focus here on the fact, you know, back during the days when the exiles were returning from captivity, they needed able men in the service of God. We do too. And I just want to leave that point with you. But I want you to realize there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We come into Christ together. We obey the same gospel. We're immersed into the same Lord. We rise as new creatures to serve the same Jesus. We're members of the same church that wears his name and his name only. We're all there together. 
But I guarantee you, we need able men who will serve here today. Rise up, O men of God. Something to ponder and something to take to heart. And I'll allow you to do that while we stand and while we sing this song to encourage you.